for Wednesday crew in the house. Amen. <laughs> it's good to see each of you. Amen. We are um, just uh, two more sessions of teaching to complete our teaching on Eucharistic sacrifice. Um, and before we go into scripture, you want to open your Bibles, you can go to Luke 22 and 1 Corinthians 11, 23. We'll read those uh, just before we start. And um, we'll take you through a development of theological um, perceptions in the early church. And we'll get started in just a minute. Just before we do... Um, let me make this uh, announcement for Wednesday. Um, Wednesday, May 23rd is going to be a special Wednesday Bible study. Wednesday, May 23rd is a special Wednesday Bible study. If you have not gone to Netflix yet to watch the movie come Sunday, see it once or twice before you come on Wednesday the 23rd. Come Sunday. Come Sunday. The story of Bishop Carlton Pearson um, his rise and fall in the Pentecostal church, his theology on inclusion. That movie, which was released just a few weeks ago, has stirred a whole lot of buzz and controversy in the body of Christ around the country right now, really around the world. Um, and so, especially in social media, there's a lot of exchange videos and things of that nature. If you can, watch the movie come Sunday. If you want to see what really was said and what's happened, go to YouTube and pull, pull in the search bar, Bishop Carlton Pearson, Joint College of Bishops, and see the exchange there. See when they gave him the opportunity to share his theology, and then there's different video. You probably have to go through about four or five to get all of them, but his, I think, is like 40 minutes long, and then the, the rebuttals to his theology are broken up in different videos, about 15 minutes apiece. Um, it's going to be really interesting um, to see that what has happened because of the Come Sunday movie is there's, it's, there's a, a conversation that's been reopened about Christian uh, theology, about hell, about heaven and hell, about salvation, um, and universalism, um, universalist theology. And the issue is that when you watch him, not just the movie, but then watch him on the YouTube video from some years ago explaining it, or watch any of the <coughs> recent, in the last weeks, his posts on Facebook, his live audiences have just multiplied dramatically because of the movie. He's talking about it and what he thinks. There's such a, a theological meltdown happening. Christians don't know what to believe. Um, and my concern is that we don't have a consensual Christian teaching foundation in the church enough to stand and say this is what we believe amen and so uh, wednesday the 23rd we'll have an open forum discussion uh we'll take your questions if you want to submit them before we can we do that elder we can submit questions create something online at cicorlando.com and then give it give it to the end to the beginning of next week if you watch it then you can go and submit questions that'll help me to know what the questions are so i can address the answers in the Bible study that day. But I think that day we need to go Facebook Live uh, and share some answers perhaps. We'll see. If we don't go Facebook Live, I don't know if I want all that attention and all those questions. So, but I want us to have truth. Amen. All right. So anyways, um, we're going to be doing that. So be prepared for the, the movie's title again, Come Sunday. Um, Bishop Carlton Pearson. There's just a little ringing over here. Um, well, it's good to see you all. Amen. All right. Let's go to the word of God. Um, Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. Um, someone please read that for me. And then I'll read from 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. And I'll, we'll pick back up our teaching. We'll pick it right back up and go from there. Um, Go ahead and get one of the mics here. Oh, the, in the previous weeks, we were talking about the priesthood. So if you weren't here for that teaching, it's going to be important because it, it prefaced this conversation. That priesthood is still alive and well in the church. Um, and the Old Testament priesthood really never came to an end. Um, and we talked about how it shifts, the meaning of it, the role of it, 
and what the scriptures say and don't say about priesthood in the Christian church. And so if you say, well, I don't believe in, in needing a priest or having a priest, go back and listen to the Bible study so you can understand what's meant by it. But every priest offers up a sacrifice. And the sacrifice of the priesthood in the New Testament church has again changed. In the Old Testament, the sacrifice was that of, if you go all the way back to a prototype of priesthood in the patriarchs through um, Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses, the, 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 the prototypes would sacrifice different animals unto the Lord. In the official priesthood that God establishes through Aaron, and even in that of Melchizedek, there is an animalistic sacrifice. There is a blood, because the blood represents the life of man. Amen? Uh, so there's blood that's being sacrificed. In, in the Old Testament period, there is language in our Bibles as praise being a sacrifice. It was metaphoric language. It never eradicated the blood sacrifice, but it was understood that praise operates like a sacrifice. Someone say, like and as. Yeah, it's a simile. It, 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 it's similar to that, in that David says, let my praise be as the sacrifice. Let it be like the incense that rises up. So worship and praise becomes a form of sacrifice, but it never replaces the sacrifice itself. Jesus comes, and Jesus is the sacrifice, right? He, in him, there is a replacement. He replaces, according to the book of Hebrews, there is a clear replacement. Say that with me, replacement. replacement. Yeah, there is a clear replacement in that the blood of bulls and goats is no longer acceptable or good enough to God. Never was good enough. That's why they had to be spilled over and over and over. Here now we have an eternal one-time sacrifice. Read Hebrews chapter 9 and Hebrews chapter 10 to understand how the blood of Jesus replaces, is a big word, replaces the sacrifice of bulls and goats. Now, we have a sacrifice, yes or no? Is there daily sacrifice today? Yes or no? Yes. Is it multiple sacrifices or still the same one sacrifice? One sacrifice, but it happens how often? It happens daily for us. It's in the blood of Jesus. That's a very important concept we'll talk about hopefully at the end of our Bible study today, how that happens daily. Now, hear this, hear this carefully. Every sacrifice needs a priest, true or not? Right. Are there priests in the church today? Yes. yes. They offer up the sacrifice of Jesus' blood. The question is how? Where do we find the blood? Talk to me, class. Where do we find the blood of Jesus? Which sacrament? In the Eucharist. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, and then take and drink this is my blood. We're going to add another scripture in just a second in 1 Corinthians 10, 16. But let's read, go ahead, Elder EJ, read for me um, Luke 22. These are Jesus' words to the 12, and then I'll reiterate what it says in 1 Corinthians. Verse 19? Yep. Okay. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Excellent. 1 Corinthians 11.23, these are the words of Paul to the church, where he says, For I have received of the Lord. Who did he get this from? From the Lord, from Jesus. That which also I delivered unto you. This is something that's been established in the church. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said... Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Back up to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us something very important right at verse um, 15 and six, 15, 16, I'm sorry, 1-6. The cup of blessing which we bless. He's talking about the, the cup of wine in, in our worship services when we gather. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Yes or no? Yes. The bread which we break. 
Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Yes or no? Yeah. And so then he starts talking about how when we eat that, we become one. Although we're many, we become one. We, we, we unite to each other and we unite to Jesus when we eat of him and when you drink of him. Because you are what you eat, right? You take it into you. It becomes a part of you. Okay? You are what you eat. So, so we become one with Christ that way. So it is clear that Paul says, hey, this is what we do when we gather. We drink the cup. When we gather, we eat the bread. It is his blood and it is his body. He repeats the words of Jesus in the next chapter. Chapter 11 says, this is what I received from the Lord. This is what we're supposed to do. We heard Jesus' words in Luke telling the 12, this is what I want you to do. This is what's happening here. Now, because there's always a priest and the priesthood hasn't, uh, hasn't been eradicated, there's always a sacrifice too. The sacrifice is now not many bulls and goats, one lamb, the lamb is Jesus, the blood is continual, and the blood, every time we gather, we offer it back up to the Lord and to each other in the what? In the common cup, in the Eucharist, right? And the body in the bread. And so it brings us one to Christ, it brings us one to another. I want to slow down the conversation just a bit and answer the question, how does that happen? How does that happen? And so we'll talk about the Eucharist. I want you to begin to see the Eucharist as a sacrifice. And, and we'll talk about sacraments specifically. When you think of Eucharist, what do you see it as? Let me just ask that question. What, does it, what images does it evoke in your mind? What feelings do you get? If you were to describe the Eucharist to someone, why do you do it? What is it? Holy Communion, which means what? You can get the mic. Pass the mic down to so we can get it in the recording. Uh-huh. Communion, the breaking of the bread and um, drinking of the And why wine. do you do it? Because we um, honor Christ and to that Christ will continue to live within us. Okay. Good answer. Anyone else? What does it make you think of? What, do you, what, the, what images are evoked in your mind? Go ahead. Oh, you don't have one? You can pass it if you don't. You do? If you do, go ahead. She's like, I was forced. <laughs> it's a commandment that brings us closer into Christ. Commandment. Closer relationship with Christ. Commandment that brings us closer in relationship. Yeah, the image I get is because we say it so often that this is the body. So I think of the body. This is the blood. So I think of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. You think of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. Right behind you. And then right behind you again. Go ahead. Go ahead first. I, th I think of it as he's always with me when he said he'll never leave or forsake me. When I do it, you're in me. Great is he that is in me. Abiding presence. With the, that's what you mean? Yes. That's good. All right. You got one? Thanksgiving. Oh, that's great. That's really good because the word Eucharist itself means Thanksgiving. And the humility I would imagine it took to get there. All right. Um, anyone else? All right. So all of that is correct. The one thing I want us to see Eucharist as is a sacrifice. That it is the replacement of the Mosaic sacrificial system. That it replaces the bulls, the goats, the lambs, the pigeons, and the doves. That it is, there's still, in, instead of an altar, we now have a what? A table, right? Instead of an Arianic priest, we now have bishops and priests or elders or presbyters working the table or the altar. And instead of animals, we're sacrificing, uh, we're remembering the sacrifice of the body and the blood of Jesus. Amen? That's what I want us to see it as. Now, I want us to understand that in, in terms of sacrament. Um, and to do that, let me, let me first start just by simply giving you um, the seven sacraments of the church. And we'll explain sacraments. <laughs> if I can. The devil was holding this <laughs> cap on the marker. All right. So you can write these down if you're taking notes. We'll start with, um, we're going to put them in the order that 
we see them flowing in the church historically. Is that all right? There, there's kind of a flow to this, and, and you'll, you'll understand in a moment. Baptism, number one. Uh, baptism is important because in baptism is where you start your Christian life. The old you dies. The new you comes out the water. Amen? In baptism, you are united to Christ and to his church, his body. You're not united to him until you come into the waters. How can a man be born again? What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? Of what? Of water and spirit. Where does the spirit meet us? In baptism. Right? That's the ancient Christian understanding of it. Then you go from baptism to confirmation. Con. I just had a, a brain freeze. Confirmation. All right. Confirmation. Confirmation is that declaration of faith. What is it that you believe now? I believe what the church believes, and you go through the Nicene Creed, right? You, you explain what your faith is. It is there that we know you understand this, okay? In the evangelical church, we basically take people through classes before baptism. It kind of replaces that. But the church classically has done it this way. The Nicene Creed, yeah. Um, N-I-C-E-A-N. N-I-C-E-A-N. E-A-N, the, the Council of Nicaea, that remember I've taught on the councils before where all the bishops got together to declare what it is we believe as Christians, right? So that's our, the statement of faith. Um, if, you're, if you grew up in an Orthodox church or a Roman Catholic church, even like um, uh, in an Anglican or Presbyterian church, you got to go through confirmation classes to get this stuff down pat and be able to recite it. The church recites it every Sunday. They gather in worship. We, we're reciting it now on first Sundays here. Amen? All right, just so that we understand what it is. And then um, in, the, in the Eastern Church, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, it is there where chrismation, they say chrismation here, uh, uh, instead of confirmation, that's when you get anointed. And when you make that declaration, they anoint you and the Holy Spirit comes to you there. Amen? All right. From there, we move into Holy Communion. And this is where the Eucharist happens. Depending on the tradition you're raised in, it's the table of the Lord, the Lord's Supper, communion, holy communion. But this is where Eucharist is taking place. Some evil is happening. Amen. All right. This communion is taking place, right? We are communion. Think of it, just break it down in English. Common what? Union. You come into unity with and it's common, which is also public. You come not just with Jesus. You're coming into communion with each other. Verse 17 that I didn't read, 1 Corinthians 10, 17. It says when we take the bread, even though we are many, we become what? One. So it's communion with Jesus, but also with each other. That's why you can't take this and be called joined to Jesus if you got a fence with each other. It don't work that way. Right? You can't accept Jesus and reject his children his brothers and sisters. It just, it just doesn't work. So you come into communion with Christ and the family. It's a holy communion. And then um, there is what's commonly called confession. I'm just going to put it in the common way. Confession, which is a sacrament. Also, the, the proper way is penance. Right? The rite of penance. So it is where we are confessing sins to a priest. Evangelicals, it's to each other. There's a reason I like it to a priest. Because it's someone who, when you understand the sacraments, you understand what that person represents, who that person is in unity with, with Christ. All right? We talked about that before. It's not going to be our focus today. It can be another day. Jesus does forgive you when you confess your sins to him. How many believe that? Amen. Simple as that. But confession goes just beyond forgiveness. It's a healing. It's a deliverance. Okay? Number, number five. Anybody? Uh, almost unction or anointing of who of the sick bring the sick to the who to the elders and anoint them with what oil so they might be healed and then confession and unction of the sick 
are mentioned in James chapter 5 right there next to each other. Confessing sins one to another. Who was it that the people were supposed to bring the sick person to? What's the word for elders in the Greek? Priests, presbyters. Bring the sick to the who? To the presbyters. So that confessing one to another, who's doing, who are you bringing the sick to? The presbyter. So who are you talking to? Uh-huh. The presbyter. So that confessing one to another, you might be healed. In the evangelical lens, we like to stick presbyters in another place in the scripture and just say confession there is to each other openly. No, they're actually together in the same verse. Just a little defense. Number six, another sacrament. Anyone? Tabitha, she wants holy orders. We get in there. Marriage. Which I really like the order of it because after you've been joined to Christ and we're confirmed as a Christian and you're in un unity with Jesus and the church and you've confessed your sins and got your healing and you're walking whole, now get married. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Don't throw marriage out of order there. All right, anyways. I love the way that flows right there. Because in the, in, the, in, the churches, in the church's tradition, you don't marry anyone who is not baptized, confirmed, having communion and having confessed. You don't. Why? Because as soon as you marry them, you unite yourself to someone who's not united to Christ, not confirmed by the Spirit. Come on, somebody. Uh, has no unity with Jesus and, and the church and has a whole lot of stuff that needs to be healed. There's a reason it's in order. And then finally, Tabitha, what we got? Holy orders. Holy orders that, and I'll put it just that way, but priesthood. Or holy orders. Holy orders because it's more than just priests. It's deacons, priests, and bishops. Or bishops, priests, and deacons. Holy orders is this sacrament where people now come into unity with the ministry of Christ to serve the rest of the church. Bishop being at the top, elders or priests, presbyters, assisting the bishop to do the work of shepherding and preaching and teaching, right? Right? If you have a large congregation, I just read an article last week about how um, the Catholic Church in the U.S. in uh, one of the districts, I think up near Philly, they're about to shut down a bunch of churches. Um, and the average Catholic Church right now in that part of the country has 3,500 congregants. They're about to shut it down and make it 16,000 congregants. And, the, and the, the reason is really confusing. I don't get it because how do you effectively pastor people with masses? You understand what I'm saying? It's hard to do. It, it takes away from the pastoral aspect of knowing the sheep by name. How many get what I'm saying? So they're going to need a lot of priests per parish and they're going to need a lot of deacons in order to minister to that many people in one. I, I, the, the reason, there's a long story there, but the issue is that holy orders is people standing in the ministry of Jesus to shepherd the flock of Christ. Amen? Feed and care for them and everything. Now, those are the sacraments of the church. What do you mean? What do I mean by sacrament? Anybody give me a definition based on past Bible studies? A sacrament is what? Anybody? Yeah. I was hoping for somebody to remember. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> uh Something to channel the grace of God. I like that. All right. I'm going to put a definition for sacraments right down here. Okay. All right. A visible sign for invisible grace or power or presence. Grace. Visible things that God gives us for invisible Stuff in our reality that connect to another reality. Earthly things that connect to what? Heavenly things. A channel, as Tabitha just said, that God uses to funnel his grace through. Amen? All right? Something that we're using in the physical realm. Visible sign for invisible grace. That's not the official catechism definition. That's just a roundabout definition today. My focus is not on the definition. It's an efficacious sign. It's real. It's powerful. It's the real deal. It's not just a symbol in the sense of 
um, in American thinking, in Western thinking, for us in the Western world, a symbol is this thing that represents something else. In the Eastern thinking, a symbol is not a representation of. A symbol is in unity with the real thing. It is too, a symbol is two-sided. It's visible and invisible. And they come together to connect two worlds. Make sense to you? So sign and symbol in Western thinking and Eastern thinking are two different things. Make sense to you? All right. It's a real, it's a very real thing. So Eucharist is this sacrifice that we have. And it's one of the sacraments. It's this sacrament right here. Uh, the one we call Holy Communion. Right? That one in baptism are the two that no Christian church argues about. No matter what tradition you're from, everybody believes in these two things. Everybody believes in those two things. Anybody know why? No matter, no matter if you're Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, no matter if you're Roman Catholic or Coptic Christian, it doesn't matter what church you come from, everyone believes in those two Ancient church believes in all seven, but everyone believes in these two, no matter what denomination. Why? Because of Jesus. He said, because Jesus said them, he commanded them. Because Jesus commanded the two. Jesus commanded the two, verbally commanded the two. The others, Jesus exemplifies. It doesn't mean he doesn't establish it. I establish something by a pattern. How many of you have children? Raise your hand. How many of your children have received established patterns of your life even though you didn't never tell them to do that? Because you did what? You exemplified it. Make sense to you? All right. Uh, 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 some part of the church says, well, I believe in baptism, confirmation, holy communion, and confession because they're for everybody. But not everyone's sick. Not everyone's going to get married, and not everyone's going to be ordained. So they'll say, I believe in four, because those four are for the whole church. Sacraments should be for the whole church. There's nowhere that says sacrament uh, um, has to be for every individual. The seven are for the whole church. Because guess what? When one person is sick amongst us, we all grieve, yes or no? So the healing, is it for just that person or for the whole community? Who's caring for that one person? The whole community. And when one person's marriage is blessed, are we not all blessed by their marriage? When one, person, one person's marriage is not well, are we as a community affected by their marriage? Yes. When one person becomes a priest, does the whole church rejoice in their ministry and partake of it? Yeah. So actually the sacraments are for the whole church. Not every individual will experience the last three, but every will experience the first four. Amen? Okay, so the experiences are not for everyone, but everyone will be in, uh, involved in it. Now, uh, I'm trying to get to this uh, sacramental talk about Eucharist, but I want to just lay this foundation now. Every sacrament consists of three ingredients. Are you ready? Every sacrament consists of three ingredients. The first ingredient, that is every, every one of those seven things, is going to have these three things involved in it. The first one is what we're going to call the visible aspect because they're visible signs. The visible aspect. For example, in baptism, what do we have that's visible? Water or a baptismal fount or a baptismal pool. We have water. In confirmation, what do we have that's visible? The oil. In Holy Communion, what do we have that's visible? The wine and the bread. The bread, the wine, the cup, the table, the candles, all that. In confession, what do we have that's visible? The priest, the person, and the stole that they wear, the confession stole they wear. Okay, that says, I'm, I'm, I'm not just speaking to you as a person, I'm speaking to you as a vicar of Christ, a person in the root, as a symbol of Christ, sign of Christ. In uh, anointing oil, in, uh, um, there's the answer, uh, unction of the sick, what do we have that's visible? The anointing oil. In marriage, what do we have that's visible? The rings. In holy orders, what do we have that's visible? Dressed, the garment. All the vestments and the laying on of the hands. 
in a period where there was no, no, no specific vestments, it was just the hands that came on them. The hands is the visible part. So all of them have a what? That's really important because we want people to connect to the grace of God, not just in their imagination. How many get it? You know what I, I love about um, um, the modern day church is like we're using more and more social media. We're using technology in our services, lights, sounds, colors. You'll see all types of stuff, right? Smoke machines. And we think, oh, that's right. That's new. That's not traditional. Actually, it's very, 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 very traditional. All the way back to the tabernacle of Moses where everything had specific colors and there was smoke. As a matter of fact, the one thing we're missing today is smells. But in an in a ancient church, in a, one that's rooted in tradition, there is smells, aren't there? How many of you have ever been in a mass, in a service where the incense, the thoroughfare came past you and you could smell the incense in the service? Woo, that takes you. How many understand your senses need to be engaged in worship? How many know that smells will take you somewhere? Sights, sounds, touch, feel will take you somewhere. Even the smell that we mix in the anointing oil, which I just had one in my pocket a few minutes ago, it's in my office, when we, where we mix it with the, uh, the, 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 and the, the frankincense, the myrrh, uh, the, the cinnamon with the, with the olive oil, and we mix it together. Even that smell, when you're being prayed for and that anointing oil is on you, all of that ministers to your senses. Does that make sense to you? All right, so visibility is important because we're not just spirits. We first are bodies. What did God create for Adam first? The body or his spirit? The body. You know, no, no, Adam was spirit before he was body. Yeah, that didn't need to be created. God was not created. He just was. What did he create first? A physical body. And then he put, deposited that spirit that is eternal in a physical created body. Physicality is very important. We take care of our bodies on purpose, yes or no? Your, is your body temple of the Holy Spirit? Does your body matter? Do physical things matter? Yeah, so we have colors and we have symbols, things are visible because the visible aspect actually connects us to spiritual reality. How many get that? The touch, come on. Man, when that preacher laid hands on me, something came through my body. How many, how many have that testimony right there? When they laid hands on me and prayed for me, something happened. Now, it's not that the prayer alone would have not done something for you, but how many understand that the aspect of touch is what God was using at the moment? How many understand God didn't just think man into existence? He actually what? Touched them. He put his fingers in the dust and in the dirt. When Jesus healed the one man, he just put his hands all up in his eyes, made mud pies to heal him. You know, the word became what? Flesh. Visibility is the reason we're saved. Because Jesus came and he dwelt amongst us and we be what? We beheld him. All right. So Jesus being a sacrament of the Father, he is a sign for the invisible grace of the Father. He is the physical sign. Physical things, sacramental things have to be what? visible. There's a visible aspect to things. Right? So you, you say, well, why they practice Eucharist in that church? Because there's a what? I believe the Holy Spirit is just going to come in my praise and worship. Yeah, I do too. Um, but let me ask you something. Would you go to a church that's praise and worship just out of preference? Would you go to a church that's praise and worship that had no instruments? Could God be there? Yeah. But what do you prefer? Why do you prefer the music? Because it helps you to engage in the worship. The sound does, doesn't it? How many understand that the visibility helps us to engage God? That he wants to be engaged how? Visibly. This should not just be plain. I can't wait till we get all the money to have all the right colors and the right kind of table and the right kind of everything Amen. so that when we come through and we march in on Sundays with all of our elders dressed in colors come on somebody and our worship how many understand that how many get that in the modern church we got flag ministry and dance ministry happening with all of that beauty but there's actually a traditional form of doing this 
that we're missing out on. So visibility in sacraments and divorces, why y'all celebrate the table? I don't, need the, I don't need that bread. I don't need that wine to be connected to Jesus. Besides the theological aspect you're totally ignoring and the tradition of the church, there is the one simple rational element of visibility. Because God wants you to taste him. Oh, what? Taste and that the Lord is good. Wants you to taste. Wants you to see. How many catch this? That in the tabernacle, God said to Moses, build a tabernacle because I want to dwell with my people. Who, who wants to dwell with who? He wants to dwell with us. So he tells Moses, do what? Build a tabernacle. And then puts all these visible colors and taste and smells and wines inside of the tabernacle. So that he could be what? With his people. That was God's way of connecting with his people. It still is. It still is. So Jesus says, I want you to do this. Do this eating and drinking. Do this so that you can uh, experience the sacrifice and, and have the sacrament present. So, so there can be a what? Visible aspect. Second thing is that each sacrament consists of this other ingredient. This is a very important one. The participants. Each sacrament needs what? Participants. This includes, the, the main participant we talked about the last two weeks is the priest. This includes the priest who is going to officiate the mystery. I, I love that. The Latin word for, for Eucharist or for all of this is sacrament. The Latin word is sacrament. The, the Greek word is not sacrament. The Greek word is mysterion or mystery. There is something mysterious happening here. The Holy Spirit is engaging us. The mystery, the mystery, that's what the Eastern Greek Orthodox, or all the Orthodox Church calls it mysteries. The Latin Church, the Western Roman Church, and from there forward started calling it, calling it a sacrament, right, in the Latin, sacramentum. The, the mystery, or the sacrament, that the parishioner, the believer, the Christian is about to engage God in, in a visible form, needs to be um, administered to them, needs to be officiated through a priest. All right? Every sacrament requires what? I could take the communion at home by myself. You can eat it and drink it, but will it be a sacrament? No, because you're pulling elements of the mystery aside. Um, who ordered Jesus to be crucified? Himself? Who? Who gave the last word for Israel and told the Romans, put him on the cross? Who was the one that ordered it? His name was Caiaphas. Well, who was he? High priest. Every sacrifice requires a... Come on, somebody. Jesus didn't put himself up there. You can't. He needed to be a participant, but understand Israel was a priest. God used the priest to get him up there. Y'all, I wish y'all would hear this. How many, did I just hurt somebody's theology right there? Raise your hand if you never thought about that. Okay. Am I messing with you right now? Elder Troy, you all right? I, there's always a priest and a sacrifice for a real sacrament. And now we have Jesus in the sacrament. We don't no longer have a Caiaphas. We have a new priesthood in those who have received holy orders to administer because you need participants for this. You, you do not bring yourself to the grace. Oh boy, I wish I had a church tonight. You don't bring yourself to the grace. The grace of God comes to us as it is served to us by somebody. When Jesus wanted, when God wanted Jesus to come into the earth, the first thing he had to find was a participant. And the Holy Spirit overshadowed who? 
Mary to bring her in. Is this making sense? You had a question, a comment? Hold on, say it again. Uh, for those who are here saying, well, aren't we kings and priests? And aren't we able to administer, like, say, the priest of the home to our family, our children, our wives, our whomever? Yeah, whoever and would want to argue, well, aren't we all kings and priests in this kingdom and we're a royal priesthood? The answer is no, we're not. We are metaphorically, we are not literally. You've got to listen to the last two Bible studies. We already discussed all of that. So we are metaphorically in a sense, but in a sense, David's praise was, was sacrificial too, right? Does it replace the sacrifice? No, it was just a metaphoric way. We are royal. If you want to take literally that you're a priest, then you also have to say literally you're a royal. Uh, so show me your royal bank account. Show me your highness. You're, who in here has literal royal blood in them? Not figurative or metaphoric who's literally a royal in here nobody no no the scotch fergusons no no, no. <laughs> your bank account would have revealed to me if you were a royal yeah you're not literally a royal anything we are common folk aren't we all right so we are also not literally priests we are a kind of priesthood Right? You got to read the scriptures and, and interpret it within the proper context. But well, we discussed all of that before. Yes. Kings and Lord of Lords. He is a literal king of kings. And he has little lords. It, it, we are little kings and he's the big king in a metaphoric sense. When we hear the word that declares that he's the king of kings. Yeah. We understand that God is the king. Jesus is the king. He's, He's the, you, you, does it speak of the, the, the governmental kings or the kings here? The, that's very literal. Jesus right. is king over all so kings. That's a and one day he's going to prove that over every nation, every kingdom of the earth. Okay. There will be a literal entrance of his kingdom. Right now it is a spiritual entrance. There's been a spiritual entrance of his kingdom in the earth. But one day it will literally be he will be king on earth. How many get that? Now, in terms of us, he's the king of kings, and we all kings in here. Eh, yeah. Kind of, sort of. But I'm going I'm to I'm promise you right now, I have no subjects. I am not a sovereign. I have no actual stuff. Right? There are kings in the world. There are queens in the world. Jesus one day will physically lead them all. Amen? We believe that his kingdom will be ushered in physically. All right? So for the moment, that's, we, the point is we need participants. We need someone to minister to us the sacrament. So for baptism, confirmation, holy communion, confession, unction of marriage there's always somebody who stands in holy orders that's very important because when you stand in holy orders it means you are physically in the place that Jesus would be if he were here physically you stand in his office in continuation of his ministry in the earth as he physically ministered in the earth so we physically minister in the earth in his stead we stand in apostolic succession he sent the apostles to complete his work. We are successors of those, those apostles. Amen? Is that what makes you a royal priesthood? You're standing in his stead. Yeah, the priest is. The bishop, the priest, uh, the deacon serves that bishop or the priest. We stand in that. But, but the royal priesthood that the book of, uh, when Peter writes and says, we are a royal priesthood, a chosen people, he's using metaphoric language that was reflective of Moses' words, God's words to Moses when he called Israel a royal priesthood and a chosen people. All Peter is doing is borrowing poetic language from Moses to describe that the church is still Israel. But is the church actually Jewish? Not all of them. Some of them are but not all of them. He's using poetic, metaphoric language to describe their role in the earth. That's what he was accomplishing. It was not a literal terminology. It, no, no. It, it, it is for us. It is for Christians, you and me, Christian, 
it is not literal it is metaphoric he is saying to us that we are to God as Israel was in the old covenant a chosen people a royal priesthood elected by God to announce the virtues of his light and his kingdom amen was all of Israel a, a royal priesthood no did kings rise up out of Israel yes were all of them royal no did priests rise up out of Israel were all of them priests no in a literal sense no so it's a language that's poetic so you cannot read the Bible strictly through literal lens it's too much poetry and, and linguistic arts happening there amen you just can't so all right going back to this participants are in every sacrament what else is in every sacrament big 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 portion of this every sacrament consists of these three ingredients no matter which one we're talking about they're all visible they all have participants um, and, and I'm gonna put in parentheses here uh, both the priest and the believer all right and then what else happens here boy and this was a, this would be a good time to talk about the Donatist baptism the Donatist schism of the ancient church really it, it focuses on this issue which another I promise you another day I'll talk about how important that schism is to this very day um, but we'll move right past that what else do we need here mm, proclamation of the word no that's what the priest is going to do he's going to tell you what the words say there's someone there's something that's missing here every sacrament what is the sacrament a visible sign for do we have the visible signs here what do we need now invisible grace so who do we need to show up Ah, okay so what we need is everyone needs the work of the Holy Spirit does the, the Holy Spirit go to work at baptism yes does the Holy Spirit go to work in confirmation to seal the believer yes does the Holy Spirit go to work to ratify the sacrifice in communion we believe in the epiclesis we call down that the Holy Spirit come right and turn take these natural elements and use them to be grace of God for us right don't we pray that on Sundays when I tell you stretch your hands here we pray for the Holy Spirit to come does the Holy Spirit need to be at work for that confession to bring healing and deliverance does the Holy Spirit need to be at work for that anointing oil to heal the sick does the Holy Spirit need to be at work to bring those two into one does the Holy Spirit need to be at work so that the succession ministry of the apostles and Jesus can be passed down absolutely the Holy Spirit is at work in all of these question in the back we got a mic back there go ahead so marriages outside of church great question I talked about it today are fill in the blank marriages outside of the church are outside of the church Marriage is a sacrament of the church and created by the church. Are Marriage was not created by the church. No. Cultures so have married people. Really? Water is not created by the church either. People dip in water. People have oaths they swear in society and community. Watch this. People have bread and meals they eat. They drink wine. Yes or no? People do confess things to each other, don't they? They have therapy. Do people hope for the sick? Believe for them? Do people get married? Do people put others in positions of authority over them in society? Yeah. So not everything that society does is the Holy Spirit involved in. So a marriage outside of the church is a marriage what? It's a union when that marriage comes to Christ the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 7 that the one who becomes a believer sanctifies the unbeliever because the two are what? one flesh so do, are they one flesh Tabitha? with or without the sacrament? yes 
they're one flesh because that's just human nature. Two become what? One. Their souls are knitted together. Their bodies have come together and their souls come together. That's just something that the way God created mankind. But when one of them becomes a believer, the scripture says that the one who is a believer sanctifies the unbeliever. That the believer should not divorce the unbeliever because they came, became a Christian. Because when you get saved, your whole household gets saved. Do you know the Bible teaches that? Now, what if the unbeliever is making me choose between Jesus and them? Then the Bible says choose Jesus. Let them go. So the scripture, don't be unequally yoked, doesn't apply once you get married. Because the one sanctifies the other and strengthens and builds the other up. The, the scripture, don't be unequally yoked, is not even talking about marriage. So that, so that's is being misused when people... It's out I'm, of context. Yeah, I'm divorcing because we're unequally yoked. That the scripture that talks about do not be unequally yoked is talking about what relationship is there between light and darkness, between idolatry and true worship. It's not even in context of marriage. It's in context of actually the Eucharist, about our eating and our drinking and our worship in the church. Y'all, y'all gonna get some Bible in here. I'm telling you, in this church, you're gonna get Bible for real. And not just these crazy concepts. We have used it to talk about marriage, but the truth is, in the church, you can marry another believer and still be unequally young. Right! Very few marriages are equal in yoking. As a matter of fact, all marriages end up choking. Because of the yokes you in. You got to learn how to work your marriage. And grow and heal and develop and grow. You know, it's, it's a partnership. It's a life, two lives and two paths coming together. Come on, amen somebody? Even Jesus' marriage ain't worked out. He married the church and we bunch of sinners. Who constantly betray him. Come on, Jeremiah 31 and 31. God says, my, my bride whom I married, Israel, is unfaithful to me. Read your Bible. The first couple God hooked up, and the only sins outside of Hosea and Gomer, who also had a rough marriage, was Adam and Eve. Boy, they had a rough marriage. So they had a rough marriage? Yeah. Because they started off naked and unashamed. A chapter later, they were both naked, clothed, and ashamed. Got kicked out of their house. Come on, somebody. She ended up raising the first two sons, and he was uninvolved. He doesn't get involved until the third son, and that's after the first two, one dead, and the other one has a bunch of other kids that never call on the name of the Lord and kill each other. They had a rough relationship. Is this helping anybody in here? How many understand every marriage needs a sacrament? <laughs> we need the Holy Ghost to go to work. We need to have a priest work with us and we need some visible reminders of why we got to work this out and stay together. Amen? How much time we got left tonight? We're going to call it a night right there. <laughs> what I want us to do is to begin to come to the Eucharist and to see how Christ is at work. Because the sacrifice is not just for the sake of sacrificing. This is my final point tonight. What's the purpose of Christ's sacrifice? Why did he give his life? To free us of our sins. There's a big word I'm looking for. It starts with an R. Redemption. Redemption. And for the work of sanctification, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification. To begin in redeeming us for God. For him to begin to, not, not just ultimately buy us back in relationship to God, but to redeem our thoughts and redeem our souls and redeem our lives and our families and our habits and our thinking for the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. The sacrifice is for our redemption. How does the redemption work in us if we're not practicing the sacrifice? 
Where, does, where, where do we reenact the sacrifice? In the Eucharist. None of the seven sacraments reenact the sacrifice. Only the Eucharist. Only in the Eucharist is the blood present. Come on, somebody. Only in the Eucharist is the redemption happening. Now, the Holy Spirit will use all seven to sanctify us. But only in the Eucharist is the redemption beginning. The sacrifice is fully seen there. Yeah, at baptism, our redemption begins. We're saved at baptism. I get that concept. But only in the Eucharist do we see the sacrifice in its entirety. The blood and the body. The sacrifice of the Lord. As we thank God for the sacrifice, we are participating in redemption. And in our participation of redemption, what is happening here? The Holy Spirit is what? Sanctifying. So that every time you approach the table by faith, you're being healed. Every time you come, the blood is going to work in you. Come on, somebody. Every time you come, resurrection life starts rushing through your body. Every time you come to the Eucharist, there is a, a forgiveness of your sins. There's a drawing close to the presence of God. There's all the things you guys mentioned at the beginning of the Bible study when I said, what does this remind you of? The humility is happening. Come on. What was the other word there? The thanksgiving is happening. What did you say it was? Do you, if you forgot? <laughs> she said the bread, the, it reminds me, uh, uh, Sister Audrey said the bread reminds me of the body, the wine reminds me of the blood. Yeah, the body and the blood of Jesus is happening. Oh, he'll always be with us. The abiding presence is with us. Thank you for that, Stephanie. It all is taking place again, and this is where we're going to go next week. It all happens again. Someone say it happens again. When Jesus says, take this and do this in what? Remembrance. That word anamnesis makes it happen again. How often is the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus going up to God for us? Daily. How, when, how often did he die? Once. But how often is it working? And how often do you get to participate in redemption? Daily. That is if you indeed participate in it. If you will not participate in the visible sign, then how does the Holy Spirit go to work? Come on. Y'all catching this right now? I asked you, would you be a part of a church to sing songs with no instruments? Most of you said, not really. Why? Because it helps you to effectively experience the worship with the music. Well, this is here to help you effectively experience the what? Redemption. You're going to Christ for redemption with no music. When you have no Eucharist. You singing a song a cappella. Plain. Well, isn't it my faith that saves me? Yep, but your plain faith because you have no visible signs. Do we really need to have an elaborate wedding to be married? But the sign does something, doesn't it? Do I really need delicious ingredients to eat a meal? Can it just be like bread and butter? Even butter brings flavor to bread. How many, just, how many know you don't need the flavors? How many know you don't need the flavors? You want the flavors. To what? Enjoy. To enjoy the experience. Come on, somebody. You want the Eucharist to enjoy the redemption. Is this helping y'all tonight? Why do I want something that's invisible and I'm not really going to participate in? It's tasteless. <laughs> she want to shout. She want to shout tonight. She shouted in whisper mode. Y'all tell him, man. Y'all tell him. <laughs> Raise your hand if this is making a whole lot of sense to you right now. I, you know, why Bishop keep talking about Eucharist so much? Why you got talking? Because I am tired of invisible, non participatory, participatory work of the Holy Spirit in my life. 
I want it to be very visible. I want it celebrated. I want flavor in what we're doing. I want deep meaning in it. It was designed for a reason that way. He didn't just say, just give me a tabernacle, don't worry about the colors, make it all white. That's not what he said. Jesus was not just the word that just didn't take a body. He took a body for a reason. And he comes into a culture that celebrates a lot of colors and music and dance and flavors and customs and everything for a reason. So that in handing them down the tradition of our faith, we can experience the sacrament in a way that's alive. Make sense to you? Now that's why the ritual, that's why the pageantry, that's why the colors, that and some other reasons why. That is the main reason for me. I want to see the Holy Spirit at work in all seven of these sacraments in the church, and I want it to be memorable. Come on, make sense to you? I want it to be memorable. I want us to be able to say, oh yeah, I remember when. I want it to be flavorful. All for a reason. Amen. Any questions? We have this every Sunday. We come together. We should. We'll get there by next year. That's the plan. Yes. Give, give, give Uncle is, the mic. Is it not important that when you come to communion, you take bread and wine? Or is it okay to take one and not the other? Good question. It's very important to take bread and wine. And let me explain why. In the early church, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, 5th century church, if someone was a catechumen, that is, they're in preparation to join the church, they're believers, but they've not been baptized or confirmed or they haven't come through this yet, but they are believers. They would be giving the bread only and say, you can't have the wine. You can't have the wine because you cannot enjoy the full work of the Holy Spirit till you're committed to this life. You have to be baptized and you have to know what you're coming into and you have to join us and you're not there yet. So they would just give them the bread. If the person died and never got baptized, and they say, well, their, their blood became their baptismal water. Right? So, go ahead. I'm saying you're properly baptized, you're proper, you accept the Lord, you're a Christian 100%. Should you not have them both? Or should you just choose to have bread alone or wine alone? No, you want both. Because it is the sacrifice of Christ. The bread is the what? Was the body on the cross without the shedding of blood? Was the shedding of blood effective without a body? You needed what? Both. And because we're, we're commemorating, we're remembering, and living through the redemptive work of Jesus, you want both for the effectiveness of it. So it's a great question, though, because in the early church, like I said, if you were a catechumen, you were only given one, Right? Uh, until you can come through and then they would give you both for the first time. And when that person would experience both for the first time, it was an official, this is very important for me to say, these first three right here are known as the sacraments of initiation. Sacraments of what? Because here you initiate the Christian life. And all three of these happen on the same day. You were baptized on the same day you were confirmed and at the end of the service you received communion. And then after that, you don't have to get rebaptized. You don't have to be reconfirmed. You just come back every Sunday and you receive communion. Right? So it initiated you into your walk with Christ, into the life of the church. Now, the both are necessary though because we want to experience the, sacrifice, the entire sacrifice of Jesus. You can't get the blood without the body. That's important because in the Gnostic Gnostic Christians used to teach that there really wasn't blood and there really wasn't a body. It was just a shadow of it, an image, of, a, a phantom of it. It's actually where they use phantom or phantasma of it. It was just a ghost of it. 
because Jesus was not a real person. In the Gnostic church, they couldn't believe he can physically become human because then he would defile himself as God. We're like, no, no, he came into it, and his blood and his body is very important to combat false religion, but also to enact the entire sacrifice. Did I answer that for you? Yep. Go ahead, question and question. I was just going to say, um, behind the sacrament initiation, uh huh, um, is that when the healing starts? After that, it sure it can. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to. And I mean it. And what kind of healing are you referring to? Physical healing or something? Or soul Spir- healing? Spir- or? Spiritual, yeah. Spiritual healing, yeah. Spiritual healing, I believe, is just. It's just a mystery. We don't. We can't kind of tell you exactly where things begin. It is what. It's a mystery, um, because actually your spiritual healing began when you believed, and the Holy Spirit revealed Christ to you. You know, this is where it's. Com- this is where it's completed, or when when you join the church on your journey of it. it. Here is the visible healing that begins to take place. The visible healing. Of course, Jesus healed people physically or emotionally who never went through any of this. But there was no church begun there either, was there? No. You, you um, keep mentioning about the visible aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember being taught or heard about the mystery and the invisible aspect. You know, so you keep mentioning about the visible um, so I, what I'm saying is, like some churches or some denominations, they teach more on the invisible yep. and the mystery that it doesn't have to be visible. You Correct. know what I'm saying? So that takes away some of the yeah. holiness of it. But I see what you're saying. You me. grew up in an evangelical church like most of us. And in the evangelical church, we don't believe in the sacraments. We only believe in these two. And those are not practiced regularly in the evangelical world, because there is no sacramental theology. We totally skip out how God, from the beginning of the earth, and in all 66 books of the Bible, uses sacraments. We skip God in visible form throughout the whole Bible. We don't teach it that way. We come from a rationalistic approach. Right? We come from a rationalistic approach that rationalizes that the invisible never becomes what? Yet the Bible says that everything that is visibly made was made by something what? Invisible. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that everything that's visible has an invisible start. So how come we have an invisible faith and not a visible one? When everything that is visible comes from the invisible. That's a philosophical answer. And a little bit theological. Huh? We were invisible and now we're visible. Visible images and expressions of God. Right? Go right ahead. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things, yeah, so is, first part of the question is, is it a mystery? Confession of mystery. Yes. We cannot explain where, when, why, and how the confession works. We just know it does. Therefore, it is a mystery. That in confessing, in sharing, that something spiritual is happening to bring healing. Show a hand if confessing your sins to a priest or just to a person, to another Christian, has helped you to heal. Show of hand. Okay. How much more magnified is it when the person you're speaking to is someone who stands in holy orders? Who the Holy Spirit is at work with through the participation in a visible way. How much more effective is it then? Did Jesus tell the 12 apostles when he rose up from the dead, hear me carefully, 
when he rose up from the dead, what is it that Jesus said to his apostles when he first saw them, the 12, in a room when they were hiding and afraid? John says he told them what first? Tada, I'm here. Did he tell them go and, go and preach? He did say go and preach, it just wasn't first. Did he tell them wait, in, wait to receive power? Yes, but he, that wasn't first. He told Mary, I got to go to the Father first before seeing the twelve. When he finally met the twelve, he told them, as soon as he walks through the walls, whatsoever sins you remit are remitted, and whatsoever sins you loose are loosed. Then he what? <laughs> Blew on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. What is that all about? Exactly what he said. That they have the ability to bind people to sins or loose them from sins. Did he say it to the whole church or just the 12? Who did he give his spirit to? To do that. And so the church has always believed people who walk in apostolic succession have the ability to remit or lose sins. Because this is what Jesus said. Was Jesus criticized for telling a woman, go now, your sins are forgiven you? And what did the, what did the Jews... Jewish leaders say no what no man has what the authority to do that were they wrong no they were absolutely wrong was Jesus a man was Jesus a man yes was he forgiving sins yes did they like it did they think he was wrong was he wrong no he was not wrong he was forgiving sins and when he died, what does he do? Forgive sins. But to whom does he give the authority to get that sin forgiven? To the twelve. Who stands to minister the blood and the body? The priest. Who stands to forgive? Priest. Who had the authority to forgive? Him or everybody? Him. But now he's gone. Who did he give it to? The one standing in succession of his ministry. We just were never taught it that way. Is it in the Bible? Quite clearly. Very clearly. Make sense to you? What they told us, oh, you don't need a man to get forgiven. You can confess your sins to Christ. And having confessed, he is faithful to, and just to forgive us. Yeah. But then in James, it also says that you are to go to the elders, the presbyters, to get your healing and confess your sins. It's in the same verse. He's telling you go to these people. Make sense to you all? So, so there had, we, need to, we need that ministry in the church. Now, let me tell you something. And I know it's late. We're beyond our time. Let me tell you something. Even though we never believed that and taught it that way in the evangelical church, how many know this is true? When someone wanted to talk about their issues, they say, I need an appointment with who? The pastor. Why you got to talk to the pastor? I don't want anybody just to pray for me. Who I want to pray for me? The pastor. And who do I want to talk about what's really wrong in my marriage? Why? Because we understand, even though theologically and cognitively we did not understand the scripture, we knew by nature that there's a special authority on them. I know anyone can pray for me, but when the pastor prays for me. Make sense to you? We knew that. We just didn't know how to explain it. Yep. Final it's, question. Okay, so like... I'll take one after here. Go ahead. Pleading the blood of Jesus and calling on the Holy Spirit to heal you and forgive your sins when all we need to do is go to the priest who stands in that authority who has that power. The Holy Spirit is at work here, not the priest. The priest is the participant. To minister to you a sacrament. Who is at work? I never said the work of the participants. It is the action of participants who come together by faith. But who is at work in their faith? The Holy Spirit. And let me add to you. There is no scripture that tells you plead the blood. Can't find that in the Bible or anywhere else in Christian tradition other than the last 60 years. That's a whole other matter. Find that verse and bring it to me before I die. 
what does plead the blood even mean? Tell me what plead the blood means. Someone define that. We got songs that say plead the blood. We got, we got, a, we got lingo that says plead the blood. What does plead the blood mean? The blood of Jesus to come down. You know, I asked the same question, but just to kind of maybe because people know that there is life in the blood, and that life, as long as there's life, there's no death. Like, if there is death present, then because there's life in the blood, perhaps that's why people plead the blood. I plead the life of Christ over what this. What does dead that person. mean? Well, I hear what you're saying, but what does that mean to say I plead the blood? What does that mean? To make an emotional appeal to what? For the blood to show up? Where does the... I'm asking y'all for a question. Put your head to work here. I'm going to make an emotional appeal and ask for the blood to come. Where does the blood come, class? Where does the blood come? Who, administ who ministers the Eucharist? Who's at work in the Eucharist? Who's participating in the Eucharist? The priest and, and the believer. There is no need to plead. Pleading the blood means let me drink the cup. Stop talking about the cup and drink it by faith. Do the visible work of worship. It's like saying, I'm going to give you an offering. I'm going to give you an offering one day. Do the visible, physical work and put your money there. Put your money where your mouth is. Put your faith where your words are and drink the blood. It's an emotional plea saying, I want the blood to come in my situation. Go on, find a priest or a bishop and ask them to serve you the Eucharist. And when you do it, have faith that the blood is going to come into your situation. That was my point. Impressing you for an answer. So we have colloquialisms that don't make theological sense. <laughs> Come on. On? Yeah, we could do that. Lingo that we're so used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could, that's fine. But I'm going to say something to y'all. I'm going to say something to y'all. Not one of you have ever heard me say, I plead the blood of Jesus. You can't ever claim you heard Bishop Maldonado say that. <laughs> I ain't ever said it. I'll give you $100 if you can find the time I did. I'll up it to $500. I know I ain't never said that because I dealt with that in my theology back in 1995. The only one that may have hurt me is her before 1995 because none of you were in my life. Well, that's why I said, <laughs> when he said, none of you can say bishop. You're right. right. Not bishop. Bishop But maybe said. the 15, 16-year-old, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I dealt with that right out of high school. and knew that was off along with a lot of other spiritual warfare stuff we do. That is coming. That series is coming. Yeah. In Spanish, we say, by the blood of Jesus. You can pray and say, by the blood of Jesus. That's true. But you can't plead the blood. You can only drink the blood. Is that good or what? Isn't that great? Y'all should have been tweeting and Facebook and stuff about tonight. All right, so just as we, uh, Father, we thank you for the blood right now. <laughs> thank you, Jesus, for this Bible study. Help us to grow in you. Help us to come together in consensus with what the church has always believed, Lord. Everywhere, always, and by all. And let us be that for you in this world today. We thank you in Jesus' name. We say amen. amen. Let's get our offering together. As you get your offering ready.